Hello, and welcome to the webinar on cancer management of adolescent and young adult patients. The chairs for today, uh, today's session is myself, Afsana from the UK, and my colleague Reza Said from Patel Hospital, Karachi, Pakistan, where he is a surgical oncologist dealing with gastrointestinal cancers and has a special uh, interest in peritoneal malignancies, soft tissue sarcomas, and the extended pelvic resections. He, is the ESEC, he has been the ESEC National Rep for Pakistan between 2019 and 2022 um, on the SO board and the ETC Transversal Group Rep. He chairs, um, he's been chair of the Young Surgeons Advisory Committee of the Surgical Oncology Society in Pakistan. So the webinar today was put together as there is a unique, there are unique challenges faced in the management of adolescent and young adult cancer patients that are not adequately addressed by traditional healthcare models. Today, we will go through the awareness regarding AYA with cancer, cancer biology, the models of care for AYA cancer patients, and the age specific communication skills. We will hear about fertility preservation in this group of patients. We have an absolutely fantastic international panel of experts for this evening's meeting. And it's my pleasure to join, uh, to join them for this webinar. We have, they have been all carefully selected to give different perspectives. Please note, there will be a panel discussion after we have heard from the speakers. So I absolutely urge you to ask questions using the Q&A function as we go along. And that way we can pick them up. And Reza and I between us will make sure that as many questions can be answered from the panel as possible. So please don't think twice, just ask the questions we're going along. Please note, there's also a chat function, which may we may use as we go along to actually put some additional sort of reading for yourselves. So without much further ado, let me uh, introduce you to our first speaker, who is Louise Sons, who will talk about the awareness regarding cancer in adolescent and young adolescent, adult and age specific communication skills. Louise is the chief nurse at the Teenage Cancer Trust, where she is responsible for providing specialist strategic advice to teams and representing the organization amongst key stakeholders nationally and internationally. She is involved in the global development of adolescent and young adult cancer care as a recognized specialization. She has over 30 years experience in working uh, as a healthcare professional and in academia. Her focus is on improving cancer care and services for AYA with cancer in the UK and beyond. So I hand over to you Louise for your presentation. I really must shorten that bio, it's very, very long. Right, first hurdle. Can people see my slides? Thank you. Thank you very much for inviting me. It's an absolute pleasure to, to be here uh, today and for allowing me to kick off this meeting. Um, I'm going to set the scene really for the other three great speakers, just by going into um, some of the impact of, of cancer and as, as Anna said about the communication skills we all need to have to work with this group. So I have no conflicts of interest to declare. Um, this is a little bit about what's going to be in the next 20 minutes, um, well, 19 minutes now, looking at my clock. So it's an introduction as to what it is to be an adolescent and young adult, the impact of cancer on this age group, uh, some of the challenges of raising the issue of AYA cancer in various groups. And from my perspective, how we as a charity, I work for Teenage Cancer Trust, which is a charity based in the UK, uh, meeting the needs of young people with cancer from the ages of 12, uh, 13 to 24. So just some of the little things that we have tried to do to um, address the challenges of, of raising awareness of AYA cancer. And I'll bring in colleagues and experience from other people across the world. And then just finishing on the experience and tips on communicating with adolescents and young adults, which is always a unique and personal experience, but just a little bit of what I've learned over that um, very large career that I've so mentioned in my bio. So who are we talking about really for this, for this session? This is my take on things and the other three speakers might do a little slightly difference really. But if you look at sort of um, previous research, 
there are um, sort of two, maybe three cohorts we're talking about here. So there's the late adolescence and early adulthood, which the roles were of intimacy versus isolation described by Erickson in 1968. Um, which is meeting normative expectations of society, working on stabilizing your self-identity and forming committed relationships, which is you can kind of see from the language and expectations is very much sort of focused in well, what's happening nearly 60 years ago. More recently, Arnott's from America has taken a more individual, more individualized and personalized approach from moving to adolescent to young adulthood that transition from parent managing, supporting, being supported by your parents to accepting personal responsibility, financial dependence, making autonomous decisions and forming a unique relationship with your parents. But for those of us in practice, and I'm sure many of you on this call, what we are sort of looking at in, in practice to describe those two theories really, is the young chap from the red t-shirt who's just entering adolescence and puberty say 12, 13, to the young chap with the suitcase, which for the UK, he'd be in his mid twenties. If you're looking to further afield, then he would probably be 39. We'll come back to that in a couple more slides. So there's a huge depth and breadth of transition across multiple aspects of young people's lives from that young chap with the football to, and that should be a rugby given it's the World Cup, um, to the young guy with, with a briefcase. And that's basically what this session will sort of form about what that means for us in practice. Now, as I said, there's a lot of sort of work about what this means. And I think it's interesting to think about what are we talking about here? Are we talking about that transition from child to adult, which we have described in that previous slide, or are we looking at the person who's in front of us in practice, understanding who they are as a person, their own individual context, from their social, psychological, mental well-being, and who's around them in their social network, to what other factors are going on in their life globally, socially, as I said before, um, where they are with their um, political um, identity, their sexual identity, what matters to them. So I would sense that we probably most of us in practice would see and look as nurses, medics, other healthcare professionals as the person who's sitting there before us. But I think this slide is meant to illustrate this is an exciting time of your life, sometimes positively exciting, sometimes negatively exciting for these young people as they go through those transitions. And there is an element of risk taking and that starts particularly in the early adolescence that some type of sort of transitions to less adolescent less risk taking as they go through that life transition which will be picked up again in this presentation a little bit more this apparently is called fishing uh, don't try it at home because it looks very dangerous so what we're talking about there's a lot of a conversation in the AYA cancer world about what defines an adolescent and young adult. I'm not going to go into that detail, I've mentioned it before. This slide shows there's different age groups, different cohorts. I think apart from the UK, we are largely settling with a age group that's 15 to 39. I think across the world, we are pretty comfortable with what we understand as a child from 0 to 14, pretty comfortable with what we're talking about from an adolescent from 15 to say 1920. I think, as I've just said, it's where the upper age group, what becomes a young adult is we still got to settle on. But as I said, we're kind of settling on the 39 year old. As I work in the UK, my talk might be more focused on, on the 24 to five year old as a cutoff point, because that's where I work in. There is much, much um, work out there describing the impact of young cancer of cancer on a young person. It's substantial, it's multifaceted, it interrupts their life stage, alters their body image, the normal processes of becoming um, in leaving childhood to coming into adolescence, their sex sexuality, what they can do as work, what they can do in their um, education. It can also, particularly during the last COVID years, and I think we're still seeing this as we're coming out of COVID, reduce access uh, to a loss of their peer group and normal activities, i.e. forming relationships with others. It's asking them to ask questions that they is not 
normally being asked of their peers. So thinking about their own mortality, morbidity, do they want planned parenthood? And we'll pick that up, I'm sure, in fertility reservation. How we can, uh, uh, what impact this has on their mental health. And Dan might touch on this in his work, um, integration into life after cancer. Some of these things might impact on the behaviors that we see, and we'll pick this up in communication. Um, as they respond to that interruption to their life and that desire to re return to normalcy. So causing lack of adherence, not turning up for appointments, questioning processes, offering alternatives to perceived uh, best practice for medical awareness. I think the other thing that um, affects this group is the lack of awareness of cancer in health care and social care systems. This often results in complex diagnostic pathways, can be a barrier to patients accessing age appropriate care, poor outcomes in quality of life, and can block access to age relevant um, resources, clinical trials, new treatments and healthcare professionals that understand their needs. And also thinking about, I mean, I lucky I, I work in a, a universal healthcare system, but the cost of treatment, the inability for some people to afford to even to access treatment, to stay with treatment, but also for some young people, the ongoing financial um, toxicity by paying debt for healthcare and the lack of their opportunities to uh, fund and earn as much as their peers that haven't had this. So that's the background, that's the context very quickly. So how do we know, how can we support young people have their own awareness of their cancer? We've recently done some work within our group and I've identified some with a um, market research group that very few people who we, talk, who we um, questioned actually were aware of the five key symptoms or kinds five key signs and symptoms of cancer in this age group. And that was in the general public, there was low awareness, but over, particularly looking at us sort of 18 to 24 year olds, there was 82% um, of the people who we questioned didn't know about what the uh, signs, uh, potential symptoms that they should um, potentially go to a, a, a seek, seek healthcare advice that could be cancer. So I think there's a general lack of awareness in that population. I'll come to other populations in a minute. So we, what we have done as, as a charity, and I think many other cancer charities and NGOs across the world do the same thing, is we've very much focused on what the information needs of young people are. We've based this on evidence from, from researchers who we work with. We have given the standard sort of practical advice that you would see on a normal wealth um, website um, we have also uh, about cancer diagnosis, how to um, manage your fertility, what to do with your mental health. But increasingly, what we have also done is worked with influencers, young people. It's fine for a healthcare professional to give advice or to read something on, on a screen. But for this group, your peers matter very much. So hearing something from a peer who's got experience, can use your language, can understand where you're coming from is very much what we're moving towards for giving our information these days. So we have used things like TikTok, we use um, cancer stories on our website where young people have given experience of diagnosis and treatment through various cancer groups. We've also offered um, how to support young people so social networks have an understanding about what information they need. And as you can see from a UK perspective, we've also given um, young people information about how our healthcare system is being affected um, by various things. We did have COVID and, and now we're focusing on some information around industrial action from um, which may or may not impact on their healthcare. So how we've done this from a general population awareness is to ensure that we've got some generic campaigns. This is our generic campaign on the five symptoms of cancer. So it's called Best to Check. We have leaflets in GP surgeries. We have um, things on TikTok, Twitter, Facebook, Snapchat for young people. But we've also gone out with some pro bono support from um, advertisers to put things on bus um, shelters and also those two big things on motorways. I hope they didn't cause any accidents because they look rather alarming to me. Um, but we have gone out to best to check and we repeat this every six months. Um, and I'll come back to that point in a minute. We have also worked um, collaboratively with other cancer charities to target particular groups and underserved groups. So we worked with the UK government and with HPV charities for HPV vaccinations. Baggy Trousers is a UK charity for testicular cancer 
and Copperfield is a, a cancer charity for young people, uh, young people with breast cancer. So again, it's about very much doing the generic, but doing the targeted and timed programs of care to coincide with various cancer awareness months, teenage cancer awareness month in April, and also seasonal things. So we always run something on skin cancer in the summer. So that's constant program of web raising awareness using multiple platforms multiple voices is one of the key things we want to do in the past we've also put oh sorry there's a typo on that slide and uh, we've also put um education support into young people who have not got cancer so we have put curriculums together for um what used to be called um health and social care education in our secondary schools about what cancer is, how to um, recognize the signs and its outcomes and treatment. So that's in there. We did have a team, we did pull this program, but the two young, two gentlemen in the middle of the slide, we did have a team that went into talks to do talks at secondary schools for young people. That was an awareness and an education program. Secondary to that was also fundraising. And we did until recently have an education program for those working in primary care to understand, um, again, the signs and symptoms and the needs and the models of care for young people with cancer. And actually, as a cancer charity, we have also done a lot of work about um, politics and pe working with people. So to ensure young people are in all our cancer plans, to speak to various groups such as this afternoon, that may not work with young people with cancer, but to actually understand their needs and awareness. And we're currently working with um, new cancer um, structures within the NHS to ensure that they are actually included in, as we restructure the NHS. And I know other colleagues on this are doing those in their own countries as well. But it's also about using advocacy groups and the voice of people that we need to be recognized so that's not only the generic population or the targeted population but it's underserved groups within that population as well um so the black women rising lgbtq groups but it's also collaboration we have to do a lot of talking if you're in an aya context to raise awareness to constantly change to bring people up to speed to engage and bring new people on board um, so we have work internationally as well as nationally. So we've been doing this for 30 years. We've still got a way to go, but it's exciting. And we think we just have to accept that that's how it is in AYA Council. So talking about communicating, how do we do that with young adults and adolescents with cancer? And this is probably one of my favorite topics to talk about, but I will be brief because I'm aware. So thinking about that first slide with a group of people um, who are going through adolescence, this is geared more to the younger age group probably than the older, younger adults really. But adolescence is, is governed by, often through puberty, through what's going through by young people's emotions rather than thinking centers of their brain, particularly in high arousal situations or if there's a peer presence, hence the driving along with a car on a skateboard. So you can describe a young person as a big engine, maturing bodies, high octane fuel from their hormones, and as an immature prefrontal cort cortex and judgment as a poor driver. And because they've still got immature inhibitory mechanisms in their prefrontal cortex, what a colleague of mine has said in this slide, and I like it because it just holds that picture in my head, that some teenagers and young adults are like a Ferrari engine but with the Fiat brakes. So let's just take that a little bit further and to see how we can do that when we communicate with this younger age group. So this is some of the conversations that you will have faced in practice and certainly I faced in practice. So there's two slides, two components here, one from a cancer perspective, but because of that transition and where we are with this group, the other conversations that you may find yourselves having or your colleagues might find themselves having on situations that can be difficult both for the young person, but for us as a healthcare provider, particularly if you're not um, constantly working with this group. So those are some of the things that I've certainly discussed and I'm sure Dan and others on this call have discussed with their patients during their time and career working with these young people. So what are some of the tips and things that I have found beneficial working with this group and having conversations? It's like working with any group really. Think about what you want to say. 
we'll put that into the context of, of the young person. Again, as I said, it's about that personalization. And also these slides were sort of written when we were in face-to-face -face. very much now this is, has to be sort of taken into account as how we communicate with people onto Teams and Zoom and possibly text. So ideally, think about what you want to say, how you want to say it, what the key messages you want to get across to the young person you're talking with. Ask them if possible where they feel most comfortable to talk. Now that's not gonna be possible at all in situations be aware that they may not open up to you until they feel trustworthy with you. So you may have to have a few conversations about things that are common, football, rugby, bands and things like that. A few minutes just getting to know them before you get into your conversation. And I appreciate that might be difficult in the time that we have in our practice today. Be aware of the cultural background of the young person. Be aware of the preferences your, to young person. Because somebody's not getting eye contact with you might not be because they are not listening to you. That might just be a cultural thing. Or in one of the cases I once had is because the young person was very interested in buying a pair of trainers. And that at that moment in time was the most important thing to them. Once they bought the trainers, then they looked at me and started to have a conversation. From your point of view, from our point of view, be yourself, be who you are, be a surgeon, be a nurse, be a medic. Don't try and be a teenager and young adult. Unless you are in that age group, then of course you can be a teenager and a young adult. Show warmth, be consistent. Try not to be young, judgmental. This group age group may disagree with you vehemently. They may give you an opinion. They may appear rude. Again, think about that Ferrari and that immature prefrontal cortex. It may just be what's driving them, that fear response to seeing something and being not familiar with the situation. But as I said, try and build some time for rapport. I've probably already said this and I'm sure you do this all the time. Um, what you want to say and how you want to stay it. Give them space, give them time, allow the pauses for them to process what you think. This young person might have not been in any healthcare situation before. This may be the first time they've had this experience. This may be the first time they're being asked to make these type of decisions. They are novices often in this healthcare situation. So give them time to think. You may have to repeat yourselves. You may have to change the language. You may have to bring somebody else in. Um, try and stay calm and steady and natural tone as we all do in any conversation with our patients. If they close the conversation down, then you may just have to accept that and move on and do it another time or ask a colleague to take it on. But acknowledge what they're saying um, and try and don't, um, sorry, don't trivialize their opinions or their thoughts. Sorry, it's gone through the slides. Body language is a huge thing. This slide, I like the slide, it's dated now, but I like this slide. Be aware of our cl clues as well as your their clues, but again, be aware that their clues may not be that they're not listening to you, may just be they're involved in something else that matters to them at that time. And I think particularly on Teams and Zoom, we can only see the top of everybody. We can't see the bottom half of everybody. Quite often our eyes um, dart around, quite often we spend half our time, or I certainly spend half my time wondering why my hair looks like that or why that person's got that color wallpaper in the house. So those cues will be different on Teams, but be aware of their body language. Take cues from that, and as I said before, respect, silence. Discussing options is always a bit tricky. Um, again, it goes back to what I've said before, really. I think what helps young people make decisions is this in this slide, really. It's the familiarity of the context, the space and the time that they're giving and what they're being asked to think about. Have they heard this conversation before? Do they understand the words that are being used? Do they disagree or not agree with your facts? They may get your, their facts from somewhere else that we might not get. They may come up with alternative facts and suggestions. Again, is this something they've done before? They might, as they go older, they might have had ex similar experiences with a person in power um, or person with more knowledge than them that they are able to hold these conversations. We in nursing talk quite a lot about scaffolding. These young people will quite often have to make these decisions over a long period of time. So what we're trying to do now is to enable young people to take more empowerment and control, to um, flexible, 
to be able to coach and guide them through such conversations. Many young people will make these conversations with other people around them, but not everybody has that safety net or monitoring system to support them. We may need to put other people, other healthcare professionals in to fill that gap if young people don't have a supportive family or um, in the country alone or, or don't feel that they want to do, involve their family to, for protection reasons. Now, the other joy of working with this group is you may have conversations with other people in, in the conversation who you weren't expecting to have. So you may have siblings, you may have partners, you may have children of young people, um, you may have parents. And there, for us as the challenge is, you may have multiple conversations, you may have multiple perceptions of a conversation, um, you may have conflict, you may have coherence and acceptance, but it really is a journey, I think it is something that is a, a challenge, but a pleasure for me to work with this group, to engage with them, to help them understand, to explain something that is complex, frightening, um, and to empower them to make decisions and to practice as this as they go along. There is such a thing as a teachable moment. I think cancer can be out that without sounding too glib. Don't be afraid. If you get it wrong, you get it wrong. There's always another chance. They're usually quite forgiving young people to work with. Um, and it is the take home message is they can make appropriate decisions, consider risks if the circumstances and the people around them can understand them as an individual, can adapt to their needs in time, real, real time, can bring in support from colleagues or family if needed. Many young people go through cancer without any significant difficulties um, with communication, decision making. Some of them are much better at it than me. Um, and it's remember to look after yourself as well as their differences and to give it a go. And if not, find somebody else who can help you along the way. We're all in this. And I think adolescent and young adult healthcare workers are extremely friendly, able and very confident and happy to work collaboratively with other healthcare professionals. That's partly why I've stayed this for 30 years. So that's it. Thank you for your listening. I'm apologies if I've gone over the time sleeping. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Louise, for such a wonderful talk and a, a whiz through that. I really appreciate that. Our next speaker is, is Dr. Amrita Srikanthan, who is going to talk about cancer biology in AYA patients. She is a clinical investigator at the Ottawa Hospital, uh, Ottawa Hospital Research Institute with research interests in adolescent and young adolescent oncology, particularly improving delivery of cancer care and survivorship. Um, and in the AYA with a special interest um, in sarcoma and breast cancer. She's a regional medical lead for the Wellness Beyond Cancer Programme in Cancer Survivorship, and is also national chair for the Royal College of Physicians and Surgeons of Canada area uh, of focused competence at a diploma in AYA Oncology. She is a certified AYA oncologist through the Royal College uh, in Canada and supports regional cancer care uh, Ontario policy development for AYA clinical care improvement. Over to you, Amrita. And can everyone see my slides okay? Um, I think they're just starting to share. Okay. Um, not yet. I'll let you know when we can see them. I will try another time, just to be sure. Would you like me to start speaking to them in the interim? Um, let's just see, it's still saying has start to screen sharing. Let's just see if it comes up. Bear with us, everybody in the audience. This is what happens when you get an international faculty. Um, maybe we could take answer. this time to ask uh, a question from Q&A um, and Louise can probably address that. Um, a question from uh, Dr. Majid in, uh, how do you handle an adolescent with cancer who seems to understand his predicament but refuses treatment? So very pertinent to your talk, Louise. Oh, hang on, let me just, I can't see you. Hang on, let me start my video. Dan might want to come in this. So they don't want to start their treatment. 
Um, from practice, it's working with that young person. I think you can't make somebody start treatment, I suppose is my, is my answer at this age group. Oh, here's Amrita. Shall I start? I'll answer that, finish that question in, in a minute. Yeah, I think we'll do it in the uh, discussion. So yeah, I'll stop time. in a minute, but thank you for the question. Carry on. Over to you, Amrita. Hey, sorry about that. Um, I'm hot spotting from my phone now to see if that makes it better. But uh, over the next 10 minutes, what I hope to share with you is uh, cancer biology in adolescents and young adults. Um, my conflicts of interest are relevant to the academic and administrative work that uh, Afsana kindly reviewed with us. Our objectives over the next few minutes are to review the common AYA cancers, to understand epidemiological trends for AYA cancer, and to review two unique examples of cancer biology in this age demographic. When we look at uh, the common cancers that AYA may get, it's distinct for males versus females. For males, you'll see more commonly a GU, particularly testicular cancers, uh, lymphoma, melanoma, GI malignancies, and sarcoma. Whereas for females, you'll see more commonly breast cancer, particularly for the older young adult who's in their 30s, uh, GU malignancies such as cervical cancer, thyroid, melanoma, and hematological malignancies. However, as Dr. Soans kindly illustrated, there is a wide uh, range for what you define as AYA, depending on your jurisdiction. And younger, uh, those who are younger, so adolescents, have more hematological malignancies, such as lymphomas and leukemia in the purple and maroon. And this changes as one progresses throughout young adulthood and into the older young adult age bracket. Whereas for those in the ages of 30 to 39, you see more carcinomas, including breast cancer, thyroid cancer, and more uh, melanomas and colorectal cancers. When we look at U.S. trends, we have seen over three decades that there has been an approximately 30% increase in AYA cancers. When we look at males and females, this um, increase is driven by cancers such as sarcoma, thyroid cancer, and colorectal. But for females specifically, we see increases in ALL, non-Hodgkin's lymphoma, and Ewing's. And fortunately, we've seen decreases in cervical cancer, likely associated with the HPV vaccinations and increased screening. When we look at males, we see that the increases are with uh, low-grade astrocytic uh, tumors, testicular cancers, and head and neck cancers, with also decreases in bladder cancer. And in the center, you see that big blip in blue, and that's Kaposi's sarcoma, which was associated with the uncontrolled HIV AIDS during the pandemic and has decreased in the 90s with the use of uh, antiretrovirals. At a national or at a global level, rather, we see that the most common cancer that an AYA uh, gets depends on their country of origin and varies throughout the world. When we look at incidence rates, the most common cancer that countries are affected with is cervical cancer, followed by breast cancer in 77 countries, and then a distant third would be testicular cancer for incidence. However, when we look at what causes AYA with cancer to pass away, the distribution is different. So we see that leukemia is the most common cause of death, followed by cervical cancer and breast cancer. And this again varies depending on the sociodemographic index of the country, which is calculated based on factors such as uh, capital um, income per capita and also average schooling of the population. And we see with countries that are classified as having a lower SDI, there are higher rates of cervical and breast cancer for incidence and for death. And as the SDI increases, we see more leukemia emerge as the cause of death. And this is more um, historic data from about a decade or uh, 20 years ago from the US, which shows that the survival improvements for AYA are not as robust as for pediatric and older patients. And what we see is that the aver average annual percent increase in five-year survival has not met what pediatric populations and older adults in their 60s and 70s have gained. And we see this across for both females and males. And so I'm going to do a deeper dive into breast cancer and ALL specifically when, to look at the bi biology of breast cancers, uh, breast cancer because that's one of the tumors that I treat. And you see from this epidemiological data that regardless of whether a young woman presents with localized, regional, or distant disease, their survival is not as good as someone who is older. And when we look at leukemia, we see that the survival for AYA 15 and older is not as robust as for pediatric patients who are diagnosed with leukemia. 
And so we'll uh, transition into breast cancer first, just to take a look at the unique biology of this patient population. And we see that there's a bimodal distribution where there's an incidence that occurs around 40 and another incidence that occurs around 70. And when we separate this by estrogen receptor status, we see that there appears to be a young woman's cancer versus an older woman's cancer, where young women have more estrogen receptor negative cancer and older women have more estrogen receptor positive cancer. When we look at the cell of origin driving a breast cancer uh, development, we see that it is a distinct for younger versus older women, whereas with this study, they use a threshold of 50 years old. And we see more mature luminal cells are more common for older women, whereas mammary stem cells are more common in younger women. And for those interested in the basic biology on the slide on the uh, left, uh, slide A, this is a cell sorting study, which shows that there are far fewer mammary stem cells in older patients. And so what this leads us to conclude is perhaps there's a different cell of origin in young women. And although there's a common ancestor of breast tissue, the transformation event is different for the younger versus older population. And for older patients, you'll see more of a luminal cell getting triggered, whereas in for younger patients, it's a basal cell component that's being dri driving the malignancy development, and thus the different biology and receptor profile. And this segues into the mortality impact of, due to the cell of origin. We see from epidemiological trends that when you look at basal versus non-basal cancers, uh, the survivals are different. Um, uh, in slide B, what it shows is that basal-like cancers are much more common in younger patients with a, a peak at the age of 40, whereas the non-basal-like, which are driven by estrogen receptor, are more common at the age of 70. But we do see that mortality for basal-like cancers is high regardless of at the age of diagnosis. It's just that younger women are getting these malignancies more commonly. And the second uh, tumor that I'd like to discuss the unique biology of in a bit more detail is leukemia, particularly because of those global studies which show that it is one of the higher causes of death. And what this is meant to pictorially show on this slide is that the leukemia that an individual gets varies by their age. And you can see that with the colors where ALL is much more common for the pediatric population and decreases as one gets older. Um, and that what this is really trying to show and suggest is that there's a different biology based on the age of presentation when a leukemia emerges. For ALL, again, the slide on the right demonstrates that survival decreases as one gets older, and that those ages 15 and over see almost half the survival gains as uh, younger ALL patients. When we look at the cytogenetics of ALL, what we can see again pictorially is that the genetics that drive an ALL diagnosis, again, vary quite a bit. And what's quite unique in this slide and what can be demonstrated in the light blue is that in the AYA age bracket, the other category, which is light blue, is proportionally much higher than the pediatric and the older population, demonstrating that there's, there's more to be learned about the underlying cytogenetics of young adults with ALL. When we look further into the genetics, what we see with the yellow bars is that copy number and transcription factor abnormalities are more common with childhood cancers, whereas with AYA with cancers, in the black bar, you see that they tend to be more driven by transcription factors or kinase factors, and this may help explain why some of the outcomes are different. When we look into the specifics a bit more, what we see with the five uh, mutations or subtypes that are starred, so low hypodiploid KMT2A, uh, BCL, MYC re Philadelphia-like, and BCR-ABLE. These are all associated, uh, if you look in the prevalence column, they line up with higher prevalence in AYA. And when we look to the prognosis column, we see that they are associated with poor incomes. And so at least in ALL, we have a quite a bit of robust data demonstrating that there are different outcomes for AYA, and there may be biological features driving why this might be the case. Despite these distinctions that we've identified, it does um, lead us to hope in the sense that there can be uh, specific treatments that can be developed potentially as we learn more about the biology of unique cancers. And in this slide, we see that with AYA with cancers, some of these cancers can be targeted by specific tyrosine kinases, which may help to drive um, improvements in survival and outcome. And so um, that's what I meant, hope to briefly share with you is the most common AYA cancers, um, how these change over time, particularly in the US and then also at a global level, and then two specific examples in breast cancer and leukemia, demonstrating how the biology may drive these outcomes. Thanks very much.
Thank you very much, Dr. Srikant. That's absolutely fantastic whiz through. Um, as we're just changing the slides over, I'd like to introduce Dan Stark, who is uh, who has trained at, as a medical oncologist in Cambridge, London and Leeds. He has been the medical lead for cancer services for young people in the Yorkshire region since 2006. He has been involved in building a specialist clinical service for young people in Leeds since the late 1990s. He has a huge wealth of experience and he oversees the local research programme, mainly about patient experience using quality of life data in clinical practice and the novel model uh, the novel models of follow-up after cancer care um then uh, dan supports the evolution of the nhs policy for teenagers and young adults cancer cancer care and sits on the nhs uh, england clinical reference group for children and tya uh, with cancer where he uh, chaired the consultation on uh, the NHS service specific for TYA patients. Over to you, Dan. Thank you very much indeed. And thank you for asking me to speak today. It's a huge pleasure. You know what I'm going to talk about. I'll come on to talk about it further. My potential conflicts of interest are not real conflicts of interest and they're things that you've just heard about the range of work that I do in this area. That includes uh, policy, that includes research projects, including large competitively obtained research grants. And I'm chair of a European network for this work as I'll come on to talk about before very long. I'm going to talk about a little bit about the burden of disease and that the um, uh, adolescents and young adults are an interface group. And if you can understand them as an interface group, you can understand their needs. Then I'm gonna talk about what I mean by a model of care and encourage you to think about your local model of care for this patient group across a number of important factors and including some practical action. This is a paper that anybody who's interested in this field really must read. This is uh, by Alicia Alvarez, and it describes not only the chances of death of cancer compared with other diseases in the adolescent and young adult broader age range, but also the burden of disability adjusted life years across, across the globe. It's based upon 2019 data. It shows over 1.2 million incident cancers um, and uh, hundreds of thousands of deaths across young people. Um, with the highest rates of cancer in high SDI nations and the highest mortality rates in low to middle SDI nations. We've already heard something about the fact that adolescents and young adults have specific medical needs. Their presentations and how they present their symptoms are specific. We've heard about the biology, the adverse effects they get from surgery, radiotherapy or chemotherapy are distinct. But they also have distinct specific supportive care challenges balancing their own needs with those of their family and those of their peers, and cancer results in educational delay, social group upheaval, and relationship breakdown, very sadly, for young people. There is also the personal supportive care challenge, which Louise Soans alluded to, about where this young person is in their developing personal biology from, so, from early adulthood to mature, uh, from early childhood to mature adulthood. AYA cancer care is very interesting because it cuts across the agencies we're used to. So it cuts across site-specific clinical teams and it cuts across major administrative boundaries in healthcare systems such as haematology and oncology and adult and paediatric care. And as such, it's an interface group of patients and it's at an interface in health services. QAA also have distinct clinical outcomes. Uh, as you've just seen, this is replicated over time and in many settings. There are different outcomes from people developing similar cancers at younger or older ranges, and they often have poorer survival than younger children, and some have poorer survival than older adults, as we've just heard. I would just say the survival for this client group, this patient group, is not poor. It varies from about 75 up to about 85 or 90 percent, study to study and location to location. TYA have unmet need and their unmet need when they develop cancer is because they are what's called liminal, in the shadows, not in the light of either paediatric or adult approaches. So if you borrow a paediatric approach or a normal adult approach to manage your teenagers, adolescents and young adults, you won't really meet their needs. 
they're in a transition point, and that helps you understand what you mean in your own care by an adolescent and young adult. Um, if adolescents and young adults, if young people are socially, culturally adults in your community from the age of 14, then maybe people are adolescents and young adults from 11 through to 17 or 18. If the point of transition to cultural and personal independence is in the mid-20s, then maybe adolescents and young adults are from 19 through to the late 30s. So you can see why in different geographies and different communities and different societies, we perfectly appropriately have different definitions of what we mean by this group. Conventional healthcare systems struggle to meet the needs of this, this care group, and that isn't to do with money. Recent publications have shown problems with communication, care prioritization, loss to follow up in very well funded systems. So this isn't being able to do this isn't a, really about the funding of the system you work in. It's about wanting to have the right model of care for you. Bear in mind that the quality of life of somebody with cancer is better predicted by where they are in their development than by the type of cancer that they've got. And so really think about that developmental stage is very important. And don't blame yourself if you haven't got teenage or adolescent and young adult specific services or this sort of model of care. It isn't their fault, it isn't our fault. This transition is a relatively recent thing in human development. And as such, we have to update our healthcare systems for our modern world. These are the key areas in which um, the key elements in which um, adolescents and young adults have special needs for care. And this is a paper, uh, a table from a paper published um, in ESMO Open in recent years by myself and a range of your colleagues. And the key things, given that I'm talking to a surgical society, I thought I'd look at various specific surgical issues where you might want to think differently. Firstly, to remember that cancer occurs, albeit rarely in this age range, and the presentations are specific, so think when referred a case. Don't close your mind to cancer just because it's a young patient and you associate cancer with older people. Make decisions based on the fact that the young person's body around the cancer is often, not always, but often fit. And therefore, this young person will live with their cancer longer than you're expecting if you're dealing with comparing them to an older adult. So therefore, they may want to be proactive and interventional, and it may make sense to do so for longer than you would be used to in an older person. I'll come on to communication to build a bit on what Louise said earlier. Remember to think about fertility before operations and surgical decisions, where we think about it before radiotherapy and chemotherapy decisions. Remember to think about engaging a wide team. Remember to think about how adolescents and young adults are uncomfortable with places of care that you may be as a healthcare professional very familiar with. And remember to think that they will use social media, you'll be unlikely to stop them, and they may use social media in relation to the way you work with them. So be prepared for that. It's not a criticism, it's normal. So this talks about models of care. A model of care is a way of delivering health care that is evidence-based and defines standards. It's how we structure things specific to a group. It should have core principles that we can use to structure how we implement it, um, and subsequently evaluate it. It should have expertise within the model of care. It should define its pathways, meaning it should define how people move through the care, sick care and treatment system, bearing in mind the rare, relative rarity and the unusual presentations. It should cover a specific geographical patch. It, um, and it should have guidelines, but guidelines are not enough. It also needs an appropriate intelligent learning system to learn from using its guidelines and when it uses them well and what it gets and what else it needs to develop. There are options. You can take off the uh, peg to define a model of care for uh, adolescents and young adults, including the Teenage Cancer Trust blueprint, which is illustrated on the slide here, the model in the paper from ESMO of European Society of Medical Oncology and SIOP Europe, jointly, and similar models in France, America, Australia, and Italy that are published and well described. But there are many different ways to get from where different services are to where they are here, and different ways have been chosen in the UK, Australia, the US, and Germany to fit with their local cultures and their economies and what they want to do. First of all, young people need access to good cancer treatment. It, the the, the uh, impact of the Affordable Care Act on, of American adolescents and young adults was fundamental 
um, and showed the power of providing uh, good quality cancer care access to young people in terms of the huge improvement in stage that came about when young people were able to use their parents' health insurance. Um, they need access to good care and they may get that in an adult setting or in a pediatric setting or in an AYA specific setting. And it's important to think about that and the impact. Once you've got access to good quality health care, then there's a benefit from patient-centred, adolescent and young adults, and locally appropriate models of care. When thinking about a model of care, many AYA services that have been successfully established state that building genuine collaboration across interfaces was the key factor in success, fostering a shared sense of ownership of the programme of care. In that traditionally, the medical role is to generate interdisciplinarity and think about work between adult and paediatric or oncology and haematology groups, whereas the nurse role was to put the patient at the centre and to lead with the patient at the centre without prejudice to our medical silos. That's only one way to do it, but it, what you do should be relevant to your local settings and have the support of your local community. One of the elements of different models of care is the location for treatment. Centralizing complex cancer care, to, but providing access and equity to meet the needs of all AYA within your local system is something that we try to do in the UK. And, and we evaluated this in the Bright Light study. We had groups of patients who were meant to come for their care to a teenage and young adult principal treatment center. And we had groups of patients that weren't necessarily meant to. And then we had a third group of patients who, in practice, got care in both places, although that wasn't designed. Um, these, these decisions about how patients moved through the system from large hospital in the regional centre to small local hospital were made locally based upon travel time and patterns of expertise, cancer type and professional to professional relationships. And it's important to have a system that's nuanced like this, in our view, in the UK, because you won't fully centralise adolescent and young adult care as you have with children's care. That isn't a suitable model for adolescents and young adults. A young child can be placed, however unwell it is, in a car seat and taken to the hospital. A mature adult will usually go to a hospital when they've got a significant health problem. But an adolescent, as somebody identified in one of the questions, won't be easy to grab and drag, kicking and screaming to the hospital by their parents, and it won't be, they won't necessarily want to go, even though they're very unwell. So you have to have local services that have skills that work in balance. And what we demonstrated in the Bright Light study, and the report is publicly available and cited in the bottom corner, is we achieved very similar survival for all three patient groups. Those who had care um, in the large uh, regional centre and those who had care in the smaller local hospital. The key people who came for the care in the large centre were Ill at the, iller at the beginning and therefore improved greater in their quality of life. And there were hints that the people who had a bit of care in one place and a bit of care in another did the least well of all. They probably had the poorest survival and the least good improvement in their quality of life. So uh, therefore, we kind of felt that we needed to improve the communication within this model, but that our model of different locations of care was probably an appropriate one. Many nations made other decisions. The UK distribution of adolescent and young adult cancer services, specialist services is illustrated in the corner of this slide. As I say, we have operational delivery networks now, which work across parts of the UK to coordinate those different hospitals and get rid of that problem of people who had a bit of care in one place and a bit of care in the other. We have a detailed service specification saying what everybody ought to do. We have wider structures in the UK to support this form of care. We have national research groups running research studies about the nature of care, fertility, social reintegration, um, the outcomes of care, the pathway to diagnosis, and we have clinical trial infrastructures as well to get young people onto randomised controlled trials and a national policy interface as well. There are similar models in France illustrated here and a slightly different model in America, the US that is. So just give some thought to what sort of decisions you want to make in your location about how you want to structure this care and what you want to put around it. People are very taken by the care environment. They like these beautiful wards with bright colours and young themes where the young people can spend time together. 
But these are important and they're lovely and they're a way of getting people to engage, but they're probably not the reason why outcomes have improved from the 1980s in the UK through till now and will continue to do so. They're a focus. They stop adolescents and young adults feeling isolated, but they develop other things by that focus. They develop information that's tailored to adolescents and young adults' development stage. Not paper information sheets, but video and music and chatbots and online searching for information. And they develop a way of dealing with that disrupted self-determination, that worry, that lack of value that a young person is talking about when they use that word, I'm bored. Your model should support interdisciplinary cooperation, genuine collaboration, nurturing the relationships between medical oncology and paediatric oncology. Nurses and allied health professionals is a reasonable place to start, but it could just as well be a surgeon or a hematological oncologist or a radiation-based expert oncologist or any other where the relationships and individuals are committed to making things better for this interface group. There are ways in which you should focus your interdisciplinary cooperation. So this is a table from that same ESMO open paper, which you can read in your own time, which looked at the places where people don't see things differently across children's and adult care perspectives. You can see different parts of this where people agree and parts of it where people take different perspectives. Expect this, understand this. It doesn't make these people who disagree bad people. They're just processing things in their own way and work with them and you'll make progress. I advise you to set up a multidisciplinary team meeting to discuss these interface cancers. These can be highly effective in achieving regular face-to-face -face contact and therefore understanding. They can provide shared expertise and the range of expertise within an envelope of supportive care. They can balance, yeah, the different perspectives within the meeting. So set the age range so that the one group of people are bringing equal number of patients to the, to the meeting as the other groups of people, just so that everybody feels that they're asking as well as being asked. Focus particularly in your MDT upon high value AYA priority services, fertility, consent and assent, individualizing treatment, group activities, patient and public involvement and engagement and participation, things like music therapy. If you can become the local expert in cancer in these areas amongst your surgical colleagues, then your adolescent and young adult meetings will be valued by your colleagues and you'll be providing uh, value to them for their cases, even though they're not necessarily treating OIA themselves. Balance, patient-centered, and family-centered approaches to communication. Family-centered approach means it's the parents who participate in treatment decision-making, whereas a younger child is not necessarily fully involved. This will diminish AYAs as they move towards autonomy, but they may need that approach at some times. An adult approach assumes that the patient is autonomous at the time of the decision-making, and in fact, an adolescent and young adult be uncertain usually, have perspectives that change in different scenarios, that evolve, that fluctuate. And so neither is really right, but you're going to need to be skilled at both and use either. AYA have little experience in advocating for their healthcare needs, particularly our complex, subtle professional relationships. And they may initially lack literacy about disease, although they'll learn it pretty quickly. Therefore, they may seek advocacy. Of course, when they seek advocacy, they may seek it from parents or they may choose it from a partner or friend or other relative. But at this age, they're often rejecting the older generation's approaches. They're often saying like they do around fossil fuels or other things, that the way the older generation have done things has messed things up for them and needs to be changed. And therefore, the way you, if you're an older clinician or an older person working as a clinician or an advisor, may be in the group who they're tempted to reject. They still value your involvement. They still value having parents or other people in consultations, even though they are the oldies who don't really understand. And this does indeed buffer their distress. And parents may support the autonomy of their young person when they're involved in the consultation, but may legitimately feel that they have to protect them and demand some form of engagement. So you won't be able to use purely a AYA autonomous or an AYA children's approach, family-centered approach. You'll need to flim-flam between the two 
depending on what the question is at the time. When setting up a model of care for this group, engage a wider group of skilled people. Engage care navigators who are trained as youth workers to overcome the mystery of the system, improve adherence, and bridge the knowledge to many wider acute issues such as sexual health substance use and lifestyle and social media pitfalls. We had a question about somebody who wouldn't have had a treatment before and these wider teams make that problem much, much less. Remember that involvement of an adolescent and young adult team was the strongest predictor of positive communication and support experiences rather than where a patient was treated. So bear this in mind um, and think about involving that wider team, not doing it on your own. If there are doctors on the call, accept a different doctor-patient relationship. Patients will gravitate to and express gratitude and be warm with those who communicate them in the value they, uh, in the manner they value. They may well see perfectly appropriately nursing or social work or youth work as just as central to their outcomes as your medical decisions. Therefore, if that's going to be the case, make sure those uh, nurses or social workers or youth workers work with you understand the medical decisions that you're making to help them uh, bring the patients all along in the same way. Professionals with those skills have particular value in dealing with crisis points, those who have a warm, grateful, um, open communication style with the patient. And so upskilling allied health staff to become regular members of an AYA team um, is helpful to getting the right decisions made. But they don't come, this does this approach doesn't come naturally to some particularly medical professionals at times. So be proactive about psychosocial up. care. Yeah, but it'd be proactive in that. Please. We've got the next speaker. You want me to finish? If, if you could start wrapping up and summarising. Absolutely, really of helpful. course I can. Be proactive about psychosocial care. Don't wait for events. Put it in at the beginning. Think about collecting data. For your um for about your AYA outcomes and think about um uh, challenges of integrating across a healthcare system broadly in order to achieve that we now have entire across europe which brings together existing healthcare professional societies uh, uh, both the international societies the national AYA focus groups charities um, and individuals, and we'd like to think over time we might get the European Society of Surgical Oncology to join that collaboration. Who knows? So in summary, I've talked to you about the burden of disease, why the issues arise, the elements to consider in existing care models, and some key practical actions. At the bottom of the slide here, I've got some further reading, should you wish, and thanks to those who work with me to deliver this work. Thank you very much indeed. Thank you so much, Dan, for such a detailed presentation. Um, let me introduce you the next, uh, to the next speaker, who is Professor Beta Rao, who is a professor of surgery at the Shard Wright Medical uh, University in Berlin since 2006. She's going to talk about fertility preservation in AYA cancer patients. She's actually on the... Um, on the board for ESSO, she's had uh, held various and numerous positions, uh, um, uh, actually sharing her knowledge. In view of the shortened time, I'm just going to hand it straight over to you, Better, if you could continue with your presentation. Thank you. Yeah, thank you, Asana, for this introduction. Yes, it's getting late now and people are hungry, want to go for dinner. So just uh, this uh, topic is fertility preservation in these young patients. We heard a lot at the moment uh, about the problems of young uh, cancer patients. And of course, we have to look about what can we do in fact for them. So the impairment of fertility, the treatment, and perhaps the cancer risk due to this treatment. So um, why guidelines for fertility treatment in cancer patients? I think we have effective anti-cancer treatment, which is available. And if you imagine you are a young person and we heard all these problems they have, they 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 really have to, they, they will think about that. They will um, want to have the best treatment possible. They want to have a good quality of life uh, during the treatment. And of course, we have very uh, competent uh, treatments which increases the overall survival. But 
with these uh, aims uh, and good treatment, we also have partial or complete damage of gonadal functions. And this is for female as well as for men. And then the question arises, what is about our family planning? What should we do? Is there any hope for, for doing this? And um, as you can see here, we have uh, 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 a lot of cancer who affects uh, reprodu uh, reproduction organs uh, for first primary, which is breast, uterus, ovarian, cervical, vulva, carcinoma for females, but for men, prostate, testes, penile cancer, and all these are um, also um, uh, or a lead to death in these patients. But uh, I think we also have very good information about this, that we have, um, due to the constantly evolving treatment modalities, we often find 60% uh, five-year survival or younger. And this means that we have a psychological impairment and stresses of the partners who are now unable to bear or to give children. So this is a problem which also interferes in the benign or in the cancer patients in a couple. So we all have to face these facts. So handling fertility and damaging noxus and to complete the family planning. I think preservation of um, fertility is a constituted item in oncological treatment, premature ovarian insufficiency in a woman or infertility in a man who wants to have children are a very stressful situation for both those affected in their partners. So we have to help them to, to discuss and to talk uh, about this. And we have concepts for preserving fertility, advice how to handle the situation and uh, which is part of the oncological treatment. I think if you are a doctor, uh, an oncologist, a surgeon, uh, whatever, and have patients who have cancer and who are young, you have to know about these problems and you have to speak with the patients about this and what we can offer to them. And only nearly 90% of the patients, of the young pa cancer patients, are not sufficient informed. I think this is a very high number and we can uh, work, we have to work on this and to improve these number. So the reasons of impairment of fertility, uh, there are at least two different ways. The one is the direct damage of the reproductive system, which means ovaries, fallopian tubes, uterus, cervix, vagina, vulva, or in men, testes, epididymidis, vasa deferens, ejaculatory ducts, and the ureta and the penile. So this is what we have to look for, what we can damage by treating directly, removing or uh, cutting or, what, or, or have radiation treatment, whatever. And these both male and female reproductive systems must be functional properly for a couple to conceive naturally. Otherwise, this results in infertility. The indirect toxicity due to any other damage, and we also have to know this, is, of course, surgery, chemo, immuno, radiotherapy at the main uh, problems or main treatment uh, schedules. So we have to, to be also informed um, if we have perhaps uh, patients with rectal cancer. Yes, surgery itself can damage, but also the radiotherapy or the chemotherapy and as a doctor, which is part of this kind of treatment, you have to be informed about all this and have to talk to the patients and prepare the patient for the problems which are, will come in the future. So <clears throat> in female, we have these hormonal control circuit which uh, means that uh, you have uh, at a special times in a month the, pro the possibility to uh, conceive uh, properly, and um, which means we have these the, the hormones, which stimulates the follicles, estrogen, 
delivery, lutein hormone delivery, and then the ovulation, and then it comes to the corpus luteum. I think you all know this, and by the end, uh, if it is uh, possible, you you will um, uh, it will start to grow um, in uh, the uterus, but if not, it will just um, uh, stop secretion, the progesterone, and uh, it will stop then, um, uh, and the cycle will will start again. And the reasons for gonadotoxicity is surgery or hypertolamo hypophysial ovary tract and uterine function, damage of the ovarian vessels, direct toxicity to overgenesis and follicle growth. So toxic effects by chemotherapy, one big um, uh, column in the treatment of cancer, means that we have at least some um, uh, hormonal situation like damage of hypothalamus or hypophysial ovary tract and the damage of uterine function. These are not um, affected by systemic chemotherapy, but uh, for instance, the ovarian vessels or ovarian cells they uh, um, be they change due to fibrosis and um, of the cortical stoma, and this is perhaps uh, done by the anticyclines as chemotherapy. Also, we have direct damage of the follicles and the oocytes by oxidative stress, according to cyclophosphamides, or a cytoskeleton, according to the taxans. So this is direct damage or indirect damage due to the vessels, uh, due to systemic chemotherapy. Now comes to special risk, as you can see on the left side, uh, as, um, as younger you are, the more risky factors uh, uh, will be um, uh, diluted by our, uh, uh, by our hormonal and um, repairing system. But high risk uh, and permanent amenorrhea will be done at least in cyclophosphamide, epirubicin, taxanes, and anticyclines in females who are older than 40. So if you are an old uh, woman, um, but still young enough uh, to receive uh, and to bear children, you are on a high risk if you uh, have to undergo systemic treatment. And the median risk and low risk um, for uh, the toxicity of uh, chemotherapy is as um, if you get younger and younger. Immunotherapy, such as bevacizumab, for instance, uh, will uh, lead to 30% uh, ovarian insufficiency and very low risk is due to the treatment with metotrexate, fluoroacyl, or vincristine. So these are um, uh, not so uh, potent um, uh, drugs uh, for uh, these um, situation. For radiotherapy, we have the same situation. If you are young, you have the possibility to overcome the toxicity of radiation. But um, as you can see here, if you are uh, about 40 years, it is only six gray <clears throat> that is the, the, uh, the border of uh, the situation of of uh, the toxicity um, of the overall um, reproduction, and we have two more than two grays <clears throat> reduces the number of the oocytes. If it is four gray at the over, read this impairs the hormone production, <clears throat> and uh, this uh, leads to fibrosis and adhesion in the tube. And if you have um, the radiation on the uterus in a prepubertal girl, this should not increase for gray without functional long-term effect. But if it is a higher dose, that could lead to up uh, to risk of uh, abortions uh, in the in the later in later age. So for prepubertal girls. And if you have to uh, radiate um, uh, brain, for instance, um, you have the hypothalamus hypophysial ovary tract um, situation, 
And if it is more than 30 grades, that leads to the absence of hormonal production of the necessary uh, hormones uh, to um, get our uh, hormonal cycle done. So this is uh, for radiotherapy. That means the reasons for gonadotoxicity in female uh, just together is a resection of uterus and ovary. This is clear radiation uh, treatment of the uh, brain more than 30 grade due to uh, the uh, hypothalamo hypophysial uh, tract. Then the damage of the ovarian vessels by special drugs and the direct damage of the follicles and the oocytes. So this, these are the reasons in female, which you have to know as a surgical uh, or as an oncologist or treating um, oncological uh, patients. Now, for men, we have the same situation. We also have hormone-regulated controlled cycles of the pituitary gland. Uh, and this is also, also done by the same hormones, more or less, like female. And um, what we have to say that the spermatogenesis um, is repeated every 70 days. The regulation of the hypoto, uh, uh, hypophysial gonadal tract, um, which demonstrated maturing germ cells and the regenerative reserve um, means that we have a spermatogonial stem cells recovering after damage uh, and uh, the spermatogenesis. So they have a little bit more um, uh, possibilities to regenerate, but this is also um, in only in special situations. We have uh, in men uh, the the uh, anatomical situation for pretesticular, testicular, and posttesticular um, um, uh, localization to. Uh, to uh, damage uh, the uh, function. And the pretesticular means that uh, the azoospermia is characterized by inadequate stimulation of otherwise normal testicle and genital tract. Uh, for instance, if the um, FSH is low, and uh, of course, this can, uh, uh, this can happen in surgery of the small pelvis, for instance, prostatectomy or rectal cancer surgery or in retroperitoneal space, uh, space surgery, for instance, in lymphadenectomy or in um, the vessel surgery for aortic uh, surgery. These can lead to irreversible uh, disruption of uh, ejaculation. In testicular localization, of course, if we have to remove both uh, orchids, or, uh, both testicles, so this uh, leads to irreversible um, situation. This is logical, but if you have only to remove one side, then it depends on the function of the contralateral testis, which can lead to impairment of fertility. Obstruction uh, of the ejaculatory duct also um, is possible by radiation, but also in surgery. Then we have the post-testicular situation. This means sperms are produced, but not ejaculated. This is a condition that affects 7 to 50% of azoospermic men. And these patients have to consult, um, uh, have to uh, consultation and uh, can be, um, uh, give some advices. So uh, due to uh, chemotherapy in men um, uh, concerning the gonadotoxicity means that we have special drugs which impair the function, which is cyclophosphamide or CCNU or busulfan, ephosphamide, and all these things can lead to uh, at least um, uh, 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 prolonged permanent or temporary um, uh, disruption of uh, gonadotoxicity. So for radiotherapy, it is in men a little bit um, uh, not, not the same like in women. We have rapid dividing spermatogonial stem cells 
uh, and they are compared to late germ cell stages, which are highly sensitive to radiation. The reduction of sperm cell concentration is significantly reduced after 10 weeks, followed after uh, radiation. And um, this uh, is observed after 18 weeks, total dose of more than 2.5 gray, which is fractionated, and a single dose of more than 6 grays leads to the permanent aso-spermia and recovering of spermatogenesis depends on damage of the spermatogonial stem cells. But recovery is extended earliest after nine months um, after the end of radiation if radiation doses do not exceed um, very low uh, gray uh, like uh, 0.8 uh, gray which is very um, a very low dosage and usually uh, we have to give a higher dosage the recovery might be expected after 14 to 26 months which means two years two to three years and um, uh, this only if you have given a dosage of uh, 1.7 gray. So for men, uh, we just I have just uh, summarized. So reversible of gonadotoxicity um, is done by um, <clears throat> a low dosage, and if you have more than three gray, three gray. Um, uh, on the um, uh, gonadal um, organs. So we have uh, a permanent uh, situation, which is um, harmful. Treatment possibilities for women. We have the O4, uh, the oforopexy, which is an ovarian transposition. Um, but uh, there are sometimes adverse uh, uh, events, uh, especially um, if you have uh, uh, um, such a torquation, which leads to ischemia, or if, um, um, if you have uh, a bleeding or something like this. Anyhow, this is oncologically secure um, and um, is recommended. 80% is the success rate, uh, preservation of ovarian function, and the duration to do this and to offer this for a patient is two to three days, and then you can start your treatment. Um, same for the uh, hormonal situation, uh, which is ovarian suppression. Uh, the lowest age where you can do this is 12 to 14 years. The effectiveness is not yet really proved, but you have also uh, a very long uh, uh, six months. So therefore, this is not recommended really in cancer patients because you do not have the time to wait for this. Uh, <clears throat> you have um, uh, also uh, the cryopreservation of oocytes or unfertilized eggs or harvesters, harvesters and frozen. Uh, the adverse events um, the, that you have to stimulate um, hormonal and you have to give um, uh, an ultrasound guided puncture, which has to be undergo in anesthesia. This is not a very appropriate in prepubertal girls and uh, for hormone, de hormone depending tumors, this is not very much uh, recommended. Anyhow, it is established uh, for females and the duration is two weeks. Um, then you have a cryopreservation of ovarian tissue. Um, this is established and the birth rate is something about 25 to 30%. The duration is uh, something around one to two days. Anyhow, um, this costs a lot of money. Uh, career preservation and um, uh, preservation of ovarian tissue will cost you around uh, uh, 8,000 euro. And you have to realize that the storage is 250 euro per year uh, in Germany. Uh, so the fertility preservation in female is that you have to make a risk assessment. You have to talk to your patients. You have to uh, uh, give the patients the possibility to consult a specialist uh, uh, to discuss the situation. 
fertility preservation treatment. We have, uh, I talked about, we have the several uh, possibilities um, to offer the patients and uh, they have to choose. We have treatment also in men. We have crew preservation of spermian cells or testis tissue, which is, um, uh, uh, not so good for prepubertal boys. Um, you have to to uh, to look what which, which kind uh, do you have do you prefer? The success rate is very good. It is one week pooling or one to two days um, if you have just uh, the tissue done. We have crew preservation of special cells, uh, which performs in about 24% of cancer patients. Quality defrosting is depending on the disease and age. Uh, spermian cells, uh, crew preservation should be offered before gonadotoxic uh, surgical treatment. Um, testicular spermian extraction can be offered by azoospermia. Prior preservation of testis tissue is possible and radiation shielding has to be done in patients who get radiated um, uh, in, uh, due to the situation. Now we have, we, uh, we can do all these uh, treatment, but is this treatment um, combined with a cancer risk? We have information about this for female. So we have breast cancer, uterus cancer, ovarian cancer, and cervical cancer. They looked about this, and what they found out is that um, the fertility treatment um, does not increase the risk of cancer for breast, ovarian, uterus, cervix, but it does increase the incidence of borderline ovarian cancer. The in vitro fertilization is associated with a significant lower risk on breast and cervical cancer and is associated uh, with an increased risk of ovarian cancer. Clomiphene citrate significantly increases the risk of ovarian cancer and human menopausal gonadotropine significantly reduces the risk of breast cancer. For men, we do not have any information. Wonder, sorry, sorry, I wonder if we can just try to wrap up because... Um, well, this is the last... This is the last. Last. Yeah. Um, 10 minutes I had. Thank you very much. But thank you so much, Betta. It was such a wonderful talk. And I think it, it, the topic is so much bigger than what we had time to really address it. And I know that the webinar for ESSO ends at a certain time, which I've been told to that we have to run to. So um, for the audience, please forgive us, but we have answered as many questions as we can through the written response, um, because um, I've been told that we have to close the webinar as, as we have time. I am so sorry, we won't be able to, uh, to have any discussion at the end of this webinar because we've hit the 7.30 deadline of CET time. Um, we had some really amazing questions. There's one question that Reza, you wanted to ask the panel and I wonder if we could get a quick response from everybody on the panel. So over to you Reza, could you ask the one question that you had? Um quite a few questions actually and thank you very much for these interesting and, and very informative uh, quite eye-opening um, discussions on AYA cancer. Um, I probably would just uh, address uh, almost uh, everyone uh, and that we have seen uh, Mirta has uh, presented that the biology is, is really different. We see different molecular markers, we see different um, um, clinical behaviors as uh, the starting age or the age at which they develop cancers uh, varies. Is there a move towards including these patients? Because uh, in uh, unique trials addressing this population, because I know one of the uh, questions raised is uh, that we should include uh, AYA patients with cancer in ongoing trials, but you know, this probably may not answer the question because they, they have unique biology and their cancers are probably so different from the cancers the question, the, the um, question being is, addressed by, yeah. So the question is, do we have specific trials for AYA patients that are currently active? Dan, over to you. Quick answers. It's a quick fire. Yes. 
But the most important thing is to include them in other trials and collect specific data about outcomes. There's no need to replicate the trial infrastructure. We should recruit them and then analyze them as a separate group and learn. Okay. It's the same question from Reza to you, Better, if you could answer. I don't know if you can hear us. So, so Reza's question is, are there any trials out there specific for AYA patients? Uh, not for my uh, knowledge. Mm -hmm. uh, Louise and Amrita, may I bring you two in as well? Um, I think it's just making young people aware that they can access clinical trials and, yeah, so just making them aware that they exist and they should be offered one. Do, are there any on your website? No, we don't have that level of information, but there are other websites in the UK that will do that for them. Thank you. And Amrita, would you like to? But I agree with the other panelists. It's a the first priority is really getting AYA onto trials that are currently existing and trying to break down um, some of the bureaucracy around keeping a 19 year old off a pediatric trial at a pediatric institution, for example, here and vice versa. So trying to access what's already available. Because that's quite a, that's one of the things is isn't it in each country that the categories vary and this is one of the things that Reza and I have been looking at when this program was put together because there's very variation across the whole globe and that's what makes it quite difficult. It clearly shows this topic is very very important and I think everything that has been presented is such a high quality. We could have got doubled the time and we still wouldn't have had enough time. But I've been asked to wrap up and in the wrap up may I first encourage you, um, the delegates to follow um, to, to follow ESSO and also to look at the further reading and look at the ESSO website for further courses. Um, the ESSO Congress has a packed full programme, which I urge you to look at. And there is a link in the chat, which Rez has kindly put in there for everyone to click on. Thank you for a wonderful panel who have made this webinar po uh, possible. I specifically thank Sean and the ESSO team who have supported us to make the idea a reality. And I have to say an absolutely special thanks to Reza, who has spent many hours working with me to pull this webinar together. And unfortunately, he's had some connection problems, so he's not been able to be on screen. But Reza, I'm going to open the floor for you to say goodbye to everyone and say the last few words. So over to you, Reza, and thank you. Thanks, Afsana. This has been very, um enlightening and i thank all the panelists all speakers uh thank you very much uh for enlightening us and giving us this perspective that um sometimes the patients that we treat on um, a regular basis considering them adult they may still be um they may still require us following an aya paradigm uh, for for you know giving them information and uh, communicating to them regarding their disease. So this is quite an eye opener, uh, at least for me. Um, um, I thank all the participants. Again, apologies. This was such an extensive topic and uh, all the information that we received was pertinent. Uh, uh, we uh, apologize that we have not been able to answer questions, um, but uh, the link is still open. Uh, you can uh, get in touch with us through email uh, or through the SO team, and we would relay your questions uh, to the uh, distinguished faculty. Thank you very much again, and we'd uh, close this webinar now. <laughs>